Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Good morning, Boulevard. So we're closing down this series on blind spots that we've been in, and we've been talking about uh, things like greed and anger and arrogance, and Jim talked with us uh, candidly about lust last week, and several times we have said to you, uh, this may be the, the biggest blind spot you've ever had. You probably don't see this. I think we said that about greed and maybe even about arrogance, but today we're talking about the blind spot of fear, and I would say to you that probably... Uh, this is not a big blind spot to you, uh, that you probably are aware of some fears that you have, all right? And most of all, probably where we need to start is that we all have fears. Would you raise your hand if you're not afraid to, okay? Uh, and, and if you have a fear of something or someone that you deal with on a regular basis, okay, that's the majority. <laughs> Some of you are afraid to raise your hand. That's all right. That's all right. Okay. That's all right. Okay. But hey, just in case, just in case you're that person out there that just does not think you've got any fears whatsoever, we'll just start with this this morning. I think we better pinpoint your fears. If we can find out what you're afraid of, we can label it. Are you afraid of responsibility? If you are, then you have hypengeophobia. I don't think that's quite it. How about cats? If you're afraid of cats, you have aleurophasia. Well, sort of, but I'm not sure. Are you afraid of staircases? If you are, then you have climacophobia. Maybe you have thalassophobia. This is fear of the ocean. Or chephorobia, which is the fear of crossing bridges. Or maybe you have pantophobia. Do you think you have pantophobia? What's pantophobia? The fear of everything. That's it! All right. Maybe you're fearful of everything. Uh, Again, I I don't think it's necessarily that we don't, uh, that that we are blind to our fears. I think most of us probably are aware of it. Uh, I think it probably is, it has more to do with um, that we don't know sometimes, we don't really know the roots of our fears. We know probably when they come up, but we don't know what's at the bottom of it. And the other thing I think as we're talking about fear, and we want to talk about today a little bit is, is we, we don't recognize a lot of times where our fears lead if we remain with our fears, if we kind of refuse passively or actively to do anything about them, all right? So um, what does fear look like? What are some of the faces of our fear? You want to watch this with me? I got to say, every time I see that, the look on the last person's face, I would not try to scare her either. The, the scare, the fear went the other way, whatever. That's, that's, that's fun. That's fun. So, so what, what you see is what fear does, it flees. I mean, the first girl just, just <laughs> books it down the sidewalk. One of them almost knocks over her friend. I saw one, uh, one of these uh, Bush Comes Alive videos the other day, and, and the, the, uh, the guy's on the inside and the girl's on the outside, and the bush scares the guy, and the guy takes the girl and puts, him, puts the girl between he and the bush. Okay? Like, I mean, you, I don't know if you've seen some of these. Sometimes the, someone just takes a swipe at the bush. You know, I mean, fear does all kinds of crazy things, right? Illustrated by, illustrated by the video, what fear does. It flees. It, it sometimes fear takes us right. We just run away from everything into isolation. Sometimes it actually freezes us. 
not necessarily physically, but it freezes, it freezes us, paralyzes us from doing what we need to do the right thing. Sometimes we actually fight. We assume a defensive position. So we have kind of, kind of to sum it up, we have this sense of control in our life in a particular area, and then we have this sense that we lose that control, and so we kind of come into this protective mode. We're going to say several times today, it's important for you to know, that really you can say of most fears, our response to our fear is most of the time, it is self-protective. We are in some kind of a defensive mode, whatever that might look like. So I was looking for a definition of fear. What, what is fear? And, and maybe more so what, what moves us into fear might be better. And, and I started, I was kind of looking around, but then someone in our city group said this about fear. They said this, fear often rises out of the, and I'm going to add the word mere, out of the mere thought that I am losing control. I'll cook on that for just a second. Fear rises out of the mere thought that I am losing control. So I have to ask you, what's the problem with that? The idea or thought that I was ever in control in the first place. There's the myth, right? There's the lie. There's the misbelief that I actually have control of another person or another situation or of my past. So so we put on... Whatever bush jumps out, we put on all kinds of masks to, to kind of convince ourselves or convince others to think, to make them think, to, make, to lead ourselves to think that we are in control of all these things. So, so where did fears come from? I think that's important. Not so much what we look like on the outside, ah, you know, but what we are, what's going on inside of or where it begins. So I'm going to share with you that I think, first of all, I think fears, kind of the roots of fears, kind of come from three areas. This might help you hopefully identify some of your fears. First of all, I think they can come out of our God-given, and that's important that you know that, God-given personality. I was talking to a couple people the other day who had just come out of our Next Steps class. And our Next Steps class, we help people understand their spiritual gifts so we can move them into an area of service, and we also have them take a personality assessment. And I was talking to these people and realized became out of their personalities that one of them is very social. And we were talking about the idea that when his battery is low, it's been a long day, his, the answer to that for him to replenish the battery is to be with a lot of people, to be in a social situation. And hers is very, very different. That when she has had a long day, she wants to be, she wants some me time, she wants some back porch time, maybe some time with him, but the last thing she wants to do is go to a group, a big, big group situation, all right? That's how their personalities are fed in a sense, right? What one of the one values. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. Some of you are get her done and get her done now type of people, right? How many of you are like get her done now type of people? Okay, very good. All right, okay. And so you value productivity. You wake up in the morning and your day is significant or not whether you get a lot done. Okay, you value that. So what do you think you fear? You fear a day when not much gets done or you even take to make it more personal. You fear a day where you feel insignificant because you are not accomplishing what you think you need to feel to accomplish to feel meaningful. You may even value other people recall about, about that. Some of you are not get her done now. Some of you are get her done right people. You value it done, being done correctly, maybe even perfectly. And I'm guessing for you that if something keeps you from crossing across the line into a new relationship or into a task, that it's probably because you chiefly fear not being able to get that done perfectly. If you have a project or four sitting in your garage undone, it's because you came to a place, not because you were lazy, but because you thought, I can't get this done as well as I want. You value perfection or doing it right. You fear imperfection or the criticism that might come from it if you don't do it right. It may even be self-criticism. Some of you are lovers of peace. You, you, just, you just want everything to be like without conflict. And so if you see something that may cause conflict, fear begins to rise up in your gut, right? And if you're like me, I'm just being honest, 
I've always been a person who has struggled with just wanting to be accepted and loved and liked by people. And so if I begin to sense rejection, I know within myself that that is something that I begin to, I begin to kind of push back and remove myself from that situation sometimes, all right? So here's the deal. In each one of those, there is a value, and that is a God-given value, productivity, perfection, peace, people's acceptance. And that's a God-given thing. That's a good thing. But if it gets overextended and the value gets too high, then all of a sudden we, those fears actually fly out of that value when they get out of control or when they get too high. Just an idea. Here's something else, not just personality, but also painful past. Most of us in our lives, as some, something in our life, in our past, that is a painful moment. Could be when we were a child, could be a young adult, could be just a, very, just a one-time situation, could be a season, could be most of our life when we are just trying to survive physically or emotionally. I had this friend who I knew for a long time, big guy, Matter of fact, I tell you, if I, if I needed a bodyguard, he'd have been one of the guys that I would have called. And we spent some time, him sitting in my office just talking about some of the struggles he had in his life. And he used to talk, he used to talk about all the beer he drank all the time. I mean, like, like a lot, like, like a case of night kind of a thing. And he'd always follow with me, you know, Steve, I just like the taste of beer. I just like beer. Doesn't affect me any. I just like the taste. I was like, okay, well, then one day... One day, he sat in that same chair, and he began to tell me his story, and he began to sob. And I would tell you that in all the years I've done in ministry, probably he sobbed, wept more uncontrollably than almost anyone I've ever had sat in front of me. And what he was weeping about was a time in his childhood as a young man when some of the older neighborhood boys sexually abused him. And I'm beginning to think that maybe he didn't just quite like the taste of beer as much as he was trying to convince me. Now, now I would say this, and so I think this is important. See, he, he, he wasn't going to be sexually abused again. That was not the fear. The fear was that he was, he did not want to experience the pain of that again. He did not want to go there. He did not want his memory to go there. Thus, I think, most nights, a whole lot of beer. So sometimes, sometimes for you and I, it's not that actual situation happening again or that actual person coming in our life. It's just the thought of them and the returning to the pain. And maybe what may even cause more fear, if we want to just get down to the nitty-gritty, is the thought of taking off the Band-Aid that we are using to hide or mask the pain while the pain actually remains. Third thing is this his personality and painful past and also our role or position. I was reminded of uh, Ethan Scott and Emilia. Ethan is going to be our new, new student minister here in the next couple weeks. And, and I don't know if you knew, he graduated from college yesterday. Wednesday, he gets married. And then they've bought a new house here. And so they're going to be in the process of, of doing all the bank work and moving in. Lots of changes in their life. And I was just thinking about all these new roles, like owner of a house and new husband and graduate and starting on staff here. And there's all these positions and roles that he is new at. And you know there's got to be, I would think, some maybe some questions of, am I up for this? Am I going to be a good husband? Am I going to be a good student minister for this church? Those kind of things cause us to be fearful. Am I able to measure up? Is that, is that a big one for you? So this is Mom's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We were talking about in staff meeting the other day. We had a staff planning day, and, and, uh, and uh, we, uh, it, it came up the fact that we had made a decision as a staff that we would not be talking about lust, which Jim, Jim talked about last week. We, died, we decided we would not be talking about lust on Mother's Day. And we were pretty proud of ourselves for that, uh, for that wise decision because we were, you know, we had it on the calendar and someone said, excuse me, excuse me, 
uh, we're talking about lust on Mother's Day. And so we said, let's change that. And so we did. But what also came up was, when we talked about what we were talking about Mother's Day, and I said we'd be talking about fear, immediately, before I even finished the sentence, someone said, moms have a lot of fears. Right? Moms have a lot of fears. We, we I mean, I'm sure that you do. And so can, can I, I just want to take a couple minutes and just speak to you on some of those fears, mom. I have a mom, and I'm married to a mom, but I'm not a mom, so hope two out of three will help me on this one. <laughs> you know, I, 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 can I say it this way, that, that, if, that if it was just you and Jesus on the back porch with a cup of coffee, he loves coffee. that he might look at you, mom, and go, hey, can I just remind you of something? Maybe he'd lean a little closer, look you square in the eye and say, hey, hey, mom, they're, they're dads, like dads, not yours. And he'd mean that in the kindest of ways to take a little bit of the pressure that you feel off sometimes when you feel like it's all up to you. No, they're, they're, they're ultimately his, and you're kind of, it's kind of a weird word, but you're a steward or you're a, a manager of them here. And, and that's important that you grasp that because if not, if you think it's all on you and that you're the owner, then that puts you on this path of, of anxiety and fear that, that, you've got, that you've got to make all this right in your child's life. And, and if you keep in mind on a daily basis, and that's a hard thing to do when you're taking care of them, that they're his and not yours that he is there with you in this and that, that he gets to determine the goal for their life and not you. And that's really important. And that too should take some pressure off of you because where we think we've got to make them successful and they've got to be the best and they've got to be the best on their team, the best in their position or whatever, that's not, that's not what God would say. God says, I just want them to learn to trust me and love me. And see, that, that, that pulls a little bit of some of that Burden some of that anxiety off. Can I, I, maybe, maybe he would say this, hey, mom, I know you love them, but you can't keep them safe. Yet you can't keep them safe from getting hurt. They're gonna fall. And you can't get, you can't get them, keep them safe in a, in a tough, tough world all the time, even socially. You don't shield them constantly from failure or difficulty because, because failure and difficulty and struggle is exactly how God teaches them and the moments he uses for them to have real faith, which is primarily what he wants for them. So if we remove them from all those situations, we're removing them from his path. He, he might say, you cannot ensure your child will be a good person or a godly person. Oh, that hurts. As a parent, we want, we want to do that, but, but, but you can place them on a path. You can place them on a good path by providing consequences to wrong behavior and by allowing natural consequences and by placing them in a community where other godly adults have influence. Man, in the next 60 days, we're going to be sending kids to camp and to CIY move, and, and there are going to be all kinds of opportunities for them to be in the situations with godly people, adults, who will influence them in the right ways. Man, I would take every chance I can, every opportunity to put them in those situations if I was you. And you can, you can place them on a path by placing yourself on a path where they just see you living out personally what you desire for them. And that's not perfection. That's not getting it right. Matter of fact, they're probably going to learn more from how you handle failure than how you handle success. And so I might encourage you before I go on, don't be a path clear, removing every stone and holding every branch back and leveling out all the hills and valleys. And maybe, if I can be so ever blunt, that we all recognize as parents, moms or dads, we've made mistakes, right? We're making them. We made some and we're making them. And our kids are young or they're, they're adolescents or some of them, for us, they're, they're, they're adults. And if that's happened and we know it has, then I would say, 
remove the burden of the guilt and some of that shame and go to them and look them in the eye if you can and just go, hey, you know what? Man, I wish I'd done better at that. I, I, that was not a good season. That was not my best moment. And own it. And own it. And maybe they'll accept your apology. Maybe they won't, but that's okay because you've owned the wrong. That's a good step. And that moves us out of fear. It's a fear killer to do that right thing. So just kind of review before we go on. So we know that, that the thought, it's the thought of the loss of control, that, that fear that, we, that pushes us into thinking and attitudes that seek to regain control. And that our fears are often rooted in personality or painful past or position. And, and that we know that pretty much all of us, we have decided that most all of us, our lives are marked or even derailed significantly by fear. So here's, I think, where the rubber meets the road. What's the result? I mean, can I just live in fear and go on and just be everything really okay? Be, continue to be obedient to the Lord? I, I can't answer that question wholeheartedly. I can tell you from personal experience that here's what I found. Not from a book I pulled off my shelf on fear. I can tell you this, that fears keep, have kept me from experiencing all that God is. That when you and I operate daily in some place in our lives from a position of fear, here's what happens. We ultimately become our own protector. We ultimately become our own provider, our own caregiver. Because at the core, as we have said, fear is self-protecting and self-preserving. So we have this friend, and he's not a believer, known for a couple years, and know that his growing up life was a life, it was a tough life. And, and, and I, that, the more I hear, the more I think he just, I just don't think he was nurtured. I just don't think anybody ever probably really protected or really cared for him. And I think he just kind of grew up having to fend emotionally for himself. And so now if there's any kind of directive to him, any kind of challenge, whatever, man, there's just this defensive posture. And it comes out in his tone. You can see it in the face. He gets bristly, kind of prickly immediately. That's fear. That's what it looks like. And he's an unbeliever, but even as followers of Christ, what happens is when my life has this fear that is driving it on a regular basis, we don't enjoy the relationship that God has with us for us or what he desires for us. And, and, and let me hear, I want you to hear this. We can hear a hundred sermons on how loving God is, how our loving our Father in heaven is, but we will continue to live with an orphan mindset that Jim introduced us to last week, an orphan mindset of defensiveness and scarcity. So because we're not believing that we're a son. And I would tell you that my personal experience is not only that I am missing out on what God has for me of himself, but I also... It leads me to not enjoy all that he is, but it also in, it leads me to a place where I'm, I'm unable to love people deeply. Now, you might disagree with me on that. I didn't say love people. I said love people deeply, the full way that we're called to. Why is that? Because that requires moving outside of myself to do what is necessary for your best interest. And fear is always self-protective and defensive. And I probably won't even see a need because that has a tendency, fear has a tendency to make me absorbed in my own self and needs and insecurities. But even if I do see your need, probably at some point in time, I am gonna be locked out of being able to reach into your life and do for you what it needs. And this happens in marriages all the time. When we have not taken the time to allow God to go to the root of it and we continue to be living in fearful lives out of personality, our painful past, or our new position. So we miss opportunities to meet others' needs. We miss that opportunity to speak of word of comfort or encouragement. And so now, I mean, if we can just kind of pull the umbrella out, now 
it's not only my life is affected, but it's hindering actually your life, the life of someone else, the life of my children, the life of a best friend, because, because I am not willing to step into what God is calling me to. I'm missing that opportunity. He wants to love you through me, but I can't let that happen because my fears provide a blocking for that. Now, so just so you kind of know where we're at, if you read the Bible, you're going to find most of the Bible characters have some kind of crazy fear. And man, I wish I could just take some time and unpack all these. Abraham and Moses and Esther and Isaiah all dealt with major fears. Man, there are studies within themselves. And so I don't want this, I didn't want this to be, don't be afraid, God's got you. Let's sing him an invitation, you're out of here. I, I wanted to give you something practical, but I didn't want to give you a formula. Like, do this, this, and this, and it's all taken care of. And so, so what I want to do is I want to talk with you about this one particular person, and, and, and it, this person appeals to me as I read his story because he doesn't seem to be a person who is led by fear. His name is Joshua. You may or may not be familiar with him. And after Moses led the people out of Egypt and across the wilderness for 40 long years, the baton is handed to a person, a man by the name of Joshua, who has been his assistant. And the book of Joshua, all right, is about that. That passing on in, him leading the people into the promised land. Now, here's, here's a couple things you got to know. Why is that a big deal? Why is there a possibility for fear? Because if he looks back, he sees Moses, who is probably the greatest leader in the history of the world, freeing 3.5 million or something like that people out of Egypt and then taking them across the wilderness for 40 years, he leads his people. Nobody's ever done anything like that. And plus, this Moses guy is not only a great leader, but he also is an incredibly spiritual person. He's called a friend of God. I mean, he is, he is like close, <laughs> spiritual, highly spiritual leader. And then the thing, other thing is, if he looks ahead of him, he looks, sees the promised land, and he sees all these big people. He's got a big shoes to fill in the back, and he's got all these big people with big cities with big walls ahead of him. I think he's full of fear. So here's how Joshua starts out. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to you, to the people of Israel. This is simply Joshua's calling. This is God coming to him and go, here's what I got for you to do. Cross the Jordan into the land that I have for you. And I would remind you folks, that every one of us has a calling from God, something that he wants you to do. And it's not just a, let's just see if you can do this or if you're going to show up. No, it is a, I have something I want you to do that is a piece and a part of my plan so that others might see me and know me. The plan he has for you is a plan for a specific purpose, his purposes, his story. Pay attention to Joshua's response, what God has for Joshua here. Then he says in this, in verse 3, he says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised. So the key is these five words, that I have given to you. He hasn't given them every place. We ought to be careful. Not, not, he can't just go anywhere he wants and go, hey, God's got me. No, I have given you these places. But the other thing is that the promised land, God is saying, has already been given. He doesn't say that I'm going to give to you. He says, I have given that to you. Now, I told you I want to stop. Just take a break. I told you I'm not going to lay this out, one, two, three, four, five. Do these five things and everything's going to be the same. Well, what happens is if you will pay attention to what is happening between God and and Joshua and what he is being told and what he does, you'll see there are some things, that, very practical ways that we can alleviate our fears. But that's not the goal, not just to alleviate, but that our life would be driven instead by tr simple, active trust in God. Just getting rid of the fears, that's, that's not what it's really about. 
promised land has been given to them, but they still have to fight. That's, that's the important thing when we're talking about fears. God's not just gonna wipe your fear away from you. He, they still have to go to the promised land. They still have to fight. But God says, I've already given it to you, but you do will have to struggle. Why is that? Back to what we talked about, because God creates faith in us, which is primarily what he wants from us, by our struggles and fights, even our defeat sometimes. Whatever God is calling you to be or do, he's already been there ahead of you. And then he says in verse five, I will not leave you or forsake you just as I was with Moses. That's important, just as I was with Moses. Why is that important? Because, this, because when he says, just as I was with Moses, that means Joshua says, stop, put your feet in one place and think back. And Joshua gets to think back about 40 years where he has seen God through Moses provide plagues that finally allowed Pharaoh to go get out of here, basically. He's seen how God, through Moses, provided for Moses, took care of him by parting the Red Sea. He saw him provide for 2.5 or however many million people by offering, giving them bread every single day. He saw how he was a cloud by day and a fire by night. God has been there for Moses, and God is saying, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be there for you. So all the stuff that you're afraid of, can I provide for them? Can I lead them? Can I do all these things M M Moses did? God says, yeah. The same thing I did for him, I'm gonna do for you. Track record's important. I will not leave you. Now, I wanna, I wanna say this, that, that when God, say, God says he's got you, this is not a generic grandpa leading you through a haunted house. This is not a, it's okay, honey. You'll be okay. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Let me make that a little bit clear. My inability to do anything with my hands as far as like fixing things is pretty much known across the board of people who know me very well. Let's make that clear. I am not good fixing things, okay? So if you're getting ready to build a house and I come over and I go, hey man, don't worry about it. I'm here. You would probably be well to say, hey, Steve, why don't you step over there about 20 steps and just pray for us, would you? <laughs> I can do that. But you would not get a great amount of comfort in me showing up at the construction site announcing my presence. You know why? Because I really can't help you. I cannot help you. But when God says, I am with you, God is bringing everything in his names to the construction site, to whatever fear. When he comes up and says, I'm here with you, he says, like, he, listen, hey, now you got everything you need. I am what you need, the names of God. I am your protector. I am your deliverer. I am your freedom. I am your re refuge. I am your help. He is the answer to your fear. Not just the guy who shows up and says, I am here. Joshua 1, 7. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded. Do not turn from it, the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success. Let's say one thing. We hear right or left, and we think he's doing a good thing, and all of a sudden he's going to get really, really bad and do terrible, evil, wicked things. I'm not sure if that's what this is talking about. I think what he's talking about is that fear. <laughs> you remember those people on the sidewalk? They're walking right down the sidewalk, and all of a sudden the bush comes alive, and what are they going to like? Woo! You know, they take a hard left or a hard right. They're getting away from that. I think he's saying, don't turn right or left in fear. Just follow me. Just follow me. And man, I got to tell you, how many times have you and I come up to something that God is calling us to, and we come up to the deal, and he goes, come on, just follow me. And I was like, oh, and I get started with fear, and I was like, yep, whatever. I'm not doing anything bad morally. I'm just making decisions out of fear. And that is determining my direction. And that happens a lot to us, I think. Joshua says, and I love this, and man, I could camp out here for a long time, but I can't. He says, meditate on my word. Yes. Meditate on my word. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to do all that the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn right or left. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Two things. One, meditating. Meditating is saturating. Meditating is 
What's that when you put meat in like the juice? What do you call that? Marinating. Meditating is spiritual marinating. Yeah, you got that? So the other day, Dawn and I do some chicken wings, and we're pretty excited about it, and we put some seasons on that we thought would be really good, and we, we cooked them, and we brought them out and ate them, and they were okay. You know why? Because the seasoning stopped at the meat. But there's this place called Hackett's in Joplin, Missouri. Anybody ever eaten at Hackett's? Hackett's Wings, man. You've been there once, you're going to go again. I'd drive my mama there for Mother's Day if I was you to Hackett's Wings. And I mean, and you eat Hackett's Wings, man, that seasoning, whatever you got, it's clear. You taste it clear through to your teeth, teeth touch each other. It's clear through. Why? Because they marinate it. They have some way of making that taste go clear down through the meat. And meditation, meditation is that. Meditation is when we are hanging with the Word, where we're in the Word, where we're not just looking like believers and like we got it all together on the outside, but the Word is actually, and the Lord and the Spirit is going down deep inside us and affecting every bit of us. And it's going to the root of our fears. And that's not an easy thing to do, and sometimes it takes other people to help us along with that. And then he says, day and night, let me tell you, I've read this, I don't know how many times I've read this passage. He didn't just say day and night like, oh, he's going to give me one more thing to do. He's saying day and night, you know why? Because our fears speak to us day and night. And there have been times that I have gotten over some of my fears of rejection or whatever it might be on a Tuesday and got through the day feeling pretty doggone good to myself, walking in faith, and I wake up on Wednesday morning, and guess what is there to greet me? The same fear. And as the fear is there day and night, so must the word of God be. Remind us of who he is day and night. Saturate. Meditate. Marinate. <laughs> this is an interesting thing that he says. He says, jo he says Joshua, you got to cross the Jordan. To get to the promised land, you got to cross the Jordan. The interesting thing about the Jordan is the Jordan is typically about knee high. Most of the time, it's interesting. Like, I just read the other day, like, they couldn't always baptize in the Jordan. They had to go to special spots because usually well, there wasn't enough water in the Jordan. He could say cross the Jordan. It's like most times this year, he could just say, okay, that's no big deal. But this, God brings them to the Jordan at a time when it's spring, when it's flood stage, out of its, out of its banks. And he goes, now you got to have the priest step into the Jordan. And I would just say, and I don't want to be simplistic, but in order for us to begin to move out of our fears to what God has for us, at some point in time, you got to put your foot in the river and not just live on the bank of fear. And do you think that those priests were fearful when they put their foot in the raging Jordan River? Yes. Yes, yes. I do not believe that they were super competent. I think that they were still scared that they might be swept away and the 2.5 million people behind them might be swept away. I think the fear was there, but they chose in that fear to believe the word of God and to look at his track record and they go, we're stepping in, even though it's really scary. And that's important when we deal with our fears. He does not take our fear completely away for us so we can step ahead. We step ahead in our fears, into the confidence in God's character and his qualities. Overcoming your fears means crossing the river. It means putting your foot in there. So let's just close this. Remember, Remember, continuing to stand on the bank of fear will always keep you and I from fully experiencing God. And because of that, it will keep us from experiencing what he has for us, and that is loving others deeply and serving them. Missed opportunities to care for people. So I have to ask you as we close, what do you fear? Where's your personality, what you value? Where's that driving fears that you're not enough? Hmm? How's that affecting you? Do you have anybody helping you with that? Went to Silver Dollar City the other day. 
several weeks ago with my, some of the sons and wives and grandkids. And I saw a couple of my grandkids being scared as we got ready to step into like the scary, the scary rides. And I saw a couple of my other grandsons, grandkids just walk up to them and, and begin to talk with them, stood next to them, said, hey, I'll ride with you. That's important to have somebody ride with you, isn't it? And I saw my, my grandson, Cannon, put his arm around one of his cousins and say, hey, man, I know I was scared the first time I got on this, but I just, I'll just be here with you. That's important, isn't it? And so I would remind you that we are the body of Christ. And honestly, facing your fears and getting to the root of it, you probably don't have what it takes to do it on your own. It's why we are called the body of Christ. Why you have to be honest about those fears and so someone else can point them out when they see you being driven by those fears or when, when they see you not being willing or able to go back to those points of pain so God can take himself there and provide healing. But also as the body of Christ, I would have to remind you that because we are the parts of the body, that if there are parts of the body that are living consistently in fear and not stepping into what God has for them, whether it is generosity or serving our community, that does affect the rest of the body. And though I want, you, I want this for you individually to step out of fear into what God has for you, I would also tell you, folks, that I gotta tell you, I, I see what God has for us as a community of believers to reach this community of unbelievers he has some great things planned for us. And some of those are right around the corner. But in order for us to step into what he has, we will have to step out of our fears and put our feet in the river at times that demands us to believe and have confidence in him. And I close with this. Believing that you are in control of your life believing that you have everything necessary, that you are good enough and not stepping across the line to give him control of your life by trusting Jesus Christ on what he did for the cross. That is the ultimate, that is the ultimate posture of fear. There's arrogance there, but there's fear. I'm gonna act like I'm in control and that he is not. And I'm going to refuse to give the creator the great creator control of my life. That's, that's fearful. So I'm going to ask that you, would, that you would step in today, that you would make a decision, that you might come forward and ask questions or make that decision to step across that line from fear into trusting the one who is God, who loved you enough to give his son as a sacrifice so that your sins have and can be paid for. He is waiting for you today whatever you hold in your heart to step off the bank of fear into the river of faith so that you might have all that he has for you. Let's step into the river.